Getting back to the chemical attack, was did that not occur in Al Qaeda held rebel held territory? And who were the primary sources? Media that then tell our government that uh, this was done by the government of Syria. So the information is not credible to start with. And then in the cases of the two uh, gas attacks that we were talking about already, um, there were also technical issues about where this stuff came from, uh, the provenance of, of the sarin that allegedly was part of the attack itself was, was not, was, it was not uh, conducted in a laboratory effective way where you're controlling the sample and, and you're getting an accurate reading as to what it actually is. And, and in fact, even I think the British, they tested one of the samples recently and they said it was probably sarin. They couldn't even tell. This, this, this sample had been so fooled around with by whoever was involved in this. So I would say uh, my general rule as, as a former intelligence officer is when you're reading these accounts in the media, uh, as you suggested, always look to the source. Now, where is the source of this information? And I find if you keep playing with the, the, what looks like a source, and you keep going back source to source to source, you will find a, finally that it was somebody who was a spokesman for one of the, re one of the rebel or terrorist groups, uh, and this is, then gets filtered through the mainstream media, and once it gets filtered through the mainstream media, it's like it's the truth, and it ain't the truth. All of this stuff ain't the truth. All of the stuff you're hearing about Russia, and all the stuff you're hearing about Syria ain't the truth. And this question, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We have plenty of time, don't worry. Um, this question is for any of the panel. Since you mentioned Russia, <coughs> anyone who sees drone footage or any footage can see that the major cities in Syria have been devastated. You know, their shells of what they were. It's, it's tragic. There's hardly words to describe how bad it is. Uh, but would Russia even be in Syria were it not for all these sort of foreign aggressors that we've <coughs> been talking about? Um, I, we know they have a historic alliance with with the, the Syrian government for going back 50 years, but would this level of violence be occurring were it not for the U.S. Uh, aggression uh, with its partner states? Do you want me to answer yeah, it? Oh, it's, it's, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, well it's, it, actually the answer is, is, is fairly simple. Um, I don't think it's a direct response to the, the interference from the outside, but it's a direct response to Russia's self-interest. Russia has a large uh, Muslim population in Central Asia and in associated states in Central Asia, and it does not want to see any more spillover of the chaos that the United States has created in Iraq uh, and Libya and, and is now trying to create in, in uh, Syria. So there is a self-interest there. The Russians, as somebody said before, are not saints. Uh, and they recognize their self-interest. A, a, a guy like Putin understands the world better than a guy like Trump. Can I, can I say something? Um, I, I, I want to mention this along the same lines that um, what we're talking about when we talk about Russia's involvement is, of course, the, the threat of, of Islamic fundamentalism or, you know, jihadist extremism. They have a big problem with that, you know, in Chechnya and elsewhere. I was struck recently in reading the obituaries for Zbigniew Brzezinski, right? that not a single one of them mentioned his notorious interview with Le Nouvel Observateur in 1998, where he casually mentioned that he and Jimmy Carter had um, cultivated Al-Qaeda on the, bo the Afghan border with the S Soviet Union. Not when we thought that they did. The official story had been that they did this in response to the invasion of Afghanistan, Brzezinski chucklingly noted that they had done it six months earlier in order to provoke the invasion of Afghanistan. Right. So to get them bogged down. To get right, to give them their own Vietnam and to bleed them. Yeah. That, that this was so cute and that this had, you know, this is this ought to have been front page notes mm -hmm. yeah. uh, everywhere, and it wasn't. Uh, it was noted only, you know, in the usual uh, uh, remote, marginal outlets, and it didn't come up at all in the reverent uh, obituaries. Certainly Mika didn't mention it on Morning <laughs> Joe, <right? laughs> uh, but this speaks directly to what we're talking about, is, is that 
you know, to, 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 to a, a nightmarish extent, the, the, the scourge of Islamic fundamentalism is a Western creation, yeah. you know. Uh, like a million landmines. Yeah. yeah. The Soviets. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. It, it, many people have talked about it, but it never comes up in, in the press. Uh, yeah. If I may say something to follow on with uh, what Professor Miller just said, there's a lot of ways you can smell a rat in all of this stuff. Back when the left used to be against this kind of thing, during Vietnam, the most powerful military in the history of the world was on the side of this fake country called South Vietnam because they wanted their independence and it couldn't be achieved. What does that tell you about the so-called indigenous movement for freedom in Vietnam? Same thing in Syria. The most powerful forces on earth are behind these so-called rebels who are aspiring and they can't pull it off. It's phony baloney, okay? In, in, in uh, the Ukraine, all right, under Hillary Clinton and Victoria Nuland, okay? In a moment of candor, Victoria Nuland says, oh no, we dumped $5 billion in the Ukraine to create this phony baloney thing. The left went hook, line, and sinker for that, okay? What would happen if somebody, Iran, Iraq, oh yes, anybody, came to this country with $5 billion in cash? and went to the Tea Party, okay, and went to the survivalists or, the, or whatever. Don't you think they could gin up something that the international press could say, oh, look at this movement in the United States fighting so hard for freedom. We gotta go in there and bomb the shit out of them. It all stinks, and the left ought to be ashamed of itself, because you can see through this stuff, all right, it, the lies, it, it, it's, oh, I could go on. Uh, before, we, before we go to audience questions, I think just we all have an interest Ending this ongoing bloodbath and carnage, but it looks like the U.S. is recommitting itself to regime change in Syria. Um, how can the U.S. claim credibility in a humanitarian interest when it's partnering with some of the most abusive monarchies and regimes in the Middle East, in Syria? Um, that's open to to the panel. And after this, we'll be taking questions from. That question kind of answers it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's the, that is the pretext, though. That Assad's sure, got to go. Sure. He's a dictator. He's a monster. But does, is that credible to you, given that we're working with, like, head chopping Saudi Arabia? Not credible to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds incredible to you guys. Because I think we all want to see this carnage end. It's incredible. Is that your answer? <laughs> okay. All right then. Um, should we take numbers so everybody gets a chance and to kind of keep your questions short? Short. So should we start from the side of the room? Okay. I'm just going to give you numbers and then we'll. Okay. okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Did I leave someone out? What's up? Ten. Okay. So we'll just go by numbers because that's probably the best way to. Can I just Yes. Oh, we entertain three or four questions at a time so that uh, we may not be repeating oh, no, no, no. each other and the panelists can respond accordingly. That's a very good suggestion, thank you. Um, it so requires us to remember the question. How <laughs> about <laughs> 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 we shout out two questions at a time? Three at a time, and then, and then, yeah, but I think that would be less overwhelming. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so okay. we can get started. First of all, I want to commend you, Phil, for being here. You bring out a lot of my latent patriotism, I have to say. Uh, and I think we're going to have a tradition here at the Left Forum. We're going to have a CIA track. Because, you know, every year we have great uh, people. Uh, Ray McGovern was here, Bill Binney from the NSA. And so I appreciate uh, your being here and uh, the others. Um, I want to speak to something that you said and make another brief comment. The you were saying sort of like it doesn't make any sense. But the sense that I think is, is in there is getting other people to do your dirty work. That I, and correct me if I'm wrong, haven't, haven't the CIA in engaged in the covert operations business, tradition, isn't there a pattern of using nasty people? I don't want to get my hands dirty. I'm an officer. I use assets. Those people are the nasty, bad people. They're the dirty motherfuckers who do the murdering. We get them to do this dirty work. And if we can get some terrorists to go after Assad, fine, so much the better. Uh, so is it maybe not as difficult to understand what, what's hard to, to come to grips with as an American, if those of us who still think that way a little bit about ourselves, is 
how could they be so irresponsible to us as a people and to the people in the part of the world that they're doing this in? So that's now I want to make uh, I want to ask you about the evidence you have for the statement that you made, and I believe there is, but I want to, would like to hear it, when you said that ISIS people are being treated in Israeli hospitals, and um, um, just the, the evidence for that little piece of your story. And finally, I want to point out, in the terms of the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, there's a the new documentary that's going to be air, begin, it's going to be aired on September 17th by Ken Burns, and is co-producer, director, Lynn Nozick, I believe her name is. They showed excerpts, they were both there, they showed excerpts at Harvard a few weeks ago. In the, one of the excerpts, they're, they're stories. You'll, you'll find he talks about stories, wonderful stories, laden with strong emotion. Fine, there are powerful stories, but it's the narration that ties it all together, and it's a story about the war in Vietnam. And the narration in one of the excerpts the phrase retaliation for Gulf of Tonkin was used. In the discussion afterwards with some national security types from the Kennedy School of Government who I think were consultants on this project among others, he used the phrase again in another context, retaliation for Gulf of Tonkin. I hope most everybody in the room knows you can go and read I.S. Stone's Weekly from two weeks after the so-called incidents in the Gulf of Tonkin and see that the second one never happened and the first one was if anything retaliation for attacks against the North Vietnamese coast so, uh, so watch out for that documentary Please, I think I can answer two of you do you want me to answer that real quick yeah. uh, remember that the CIA who does the CIA work for they work for the president. the president why the CIA uses what you talk about thugs and, and that sort of thing is to a large extent driven by what they call plausible denial, right. which the White House does not want an American to be caught, or an American official, even worse, to be caught shooting somebody in the back of the head. So the White House drives a lot of these policies because they want to be able to do the thing to kill people that are enemies of the United States or perceived as enemies of the United States, and they want to be able to do it in a way that they can deny it. And not have so, it on their conscience. Yeah, well, no, they don't have any conscience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, so I, I think that's, that's part of it. Oh, Israel, Israel. Oh, Israel. Yeah. 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 They, they, you, you can probably Google it. There, was, there were uh, rebels being treated in Israel ho hospitals, and ISIS controlled that part of the Golan Heights front. So the assumption, my assumption, was that it was ISIS rebels that were being treated. Oh, but okay. you're quite right, I don't know. I never saw confirmation that it was ISIS, but it certainly was rebels against the Syrian. And the apology you referred to? The, sorry? Did the ISIS apologize? Yeah, that definitely happened. That's, that, that's, 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 that's Okay, question number two is me. Oh, that's okay, thank you. There's an elephant in the room. And it just drives me crazy because it never gets mentioned. It doesn't get mentioned in the left media. It doesn't get mentioned in the media, period. It's oil. Oil and natural gas, okay? I've been studying it all my adult life. Why? Because I was born in Beirut, because my father was the first American master spry who came to an untimely end, uh, plane crash. And so I've been trying to figure it out for years. So let me just draw you some things. First of all, how many people know the pipeline connection to Syria? TAP. Not the TAP. Well, uh, TAP. There's TAP. That's Afghanistan. No, no. Oh, tap line. Why do I know about tap line? Because my father worked on negotiating the route. So I'll get to that in a minute. But currently, here's the situation. For people who don't know, you're, you're Charlotte Dennett. Yeah, yeah. My name's Charlotte Dennett. You want to check out my father? Google the CIA's forgotten first star. Daniel you write Dennett. your name on the board so we know who Yeah, Charlotte. Dennett. My brother's a philosopher, by the way. Don't Not from Florida. Dennett. Dennett. He's, he's, he's a god. Yeah, he's a god. Is he one of the big, uh, the new atheists? Yes, the yeah. lights. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Syria was approached to allow a gas pipeline to run from this little, uh, kingdom called Qatar, right? 
and the route of the gas pipeline was had to go to Turkey and it had to go through Syria, it had to traverse Syria. All right, this is a sketchy map, okay? So that's where it was gonna go. And Qatar wanted it, Saudi Arabia wanted it, Turkey wanted it, Syria didn't want it. Why did Syria not want this natural gas pipeline? Can anyone guess? This is all big power. And US wanted it. Who didn't want it? Russia. Is this a question or that? No, I just want to show you real quickly because you'll never get a hand. All right, so Russia didn't want it because it would interfere with its supplies of natural gas and, and so it was competition. So why do you think that Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Turkey want to overthrow uh, Assad? It's, that's why they want the regime change. And, uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, please, wherever there is a um, conflict, huge conflict, mostly in the Middle East, Google country and oil and pipeline, and it'll all make sense. You asked me about TAPI or TAP line, this was Saudi Arabia, that, that they ran the big pipeline and its terminal point was Lebanon. There was a question of whether it was gonna be Lebanon or Haifa, Palestine. And there were two other pipelines that were built in the 30s from Iraq. And their terminal points were Haifa and Tripoli in Lebanon. Now you ask, why is this such a national security area? Terminal points for pipelines. The oil companies look at the Eastern Mediterranean as the, um, the uh, gateway to the Middle East oil. So all, you know, you have oil, you gotta <laughs> ship it. This is a national security area. This explains Israel, it explains everything. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, and I'm sorry. Well, don't be sorry. It's a valuable uh, perspective. Point of order. Why don't we have a little timer? Uh, yeah, we yeah, This is the thing. We really want to get to everybody's questions. Sorry. Yeah, so we didn't expect the presentation. Russia, 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 I mean, Germany has, what, 30% of its uh, energy from Russia? Russian gas. Yeah, and that's the one way they can, if they wean, and you see Germany now starting to make sounds about its own, creating its own foreign policy, maybe starting to work more with Russia because so much of its energy comes there. And what we want to do is separate Russia from Europe so that we can isolate it and go in and just stabilize it. So. Very important geostrategic background. So let's start throwing out some questions quickly. Yes. I'm just wondering because, you know, um, I just feel, you know, like uh, we're kind of like preaching to the choir in a way. And I'm wondering what we can do uh, to make, uh, to try to stop uh, the further escalation into Syria or, you know, because um, I feel like I speak to my brother who considers himself a great liberal. And, uh, and I mentioned about the, new, the uh, intervention in the Ukraine and how, you know, with the Ukraine, with the coup and everything. He got very hostile and he jumped down my throat. And I'm not going to talk politics with him anymore. But the point is that he said, where did you get that from? What are you talking about? Well, blah, blah, blah. And also my co-workers, one of my co-workers still thinks that Hussein had some connection to bin Laden and that we're fighting terror, you know, to keep us safe. So, you know, I mean, how do we, you know, we're kind of like talking to people that kind of read alternate news. And most people get their news from MSNBC, CNN. How do you get people as... Some gentleman here said, I feel also the left doesn't seem to be doing anything. You know, I don't see any great anti-war movement. Uh, so what do we do 
uh, to stop this escalation in Syria and, and other places that I have heard are going on to the Philippines in the future, Philippines and other places. Great question. Thank you. Did you want to speak to that, or should we get the next? We have a couple more. Number, 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 number one and two. We got number one and two and three. three. And so we're four. Four. Four, four. 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 I, I want to go back to an incident mentioned by Philip Giraldi. Toward the end of the Obama administration, it was initially reported that the United States and Russia had arrived at an understanding whereby they would share intelligence and coordinate their strategy against ISIS. At the time, it sounded like a, a burst of reason in an irrational domain here. And then, one or two days after that was announced, there was an attack on the Syrian barracks that killed 60-plus Syrian soldiers and completely undid that very reasonable agreement. And it, it looked like the Defense Department was an open rebellion against the administration. And also, it was a failure of the press because it was never, it was skipped over. It was just reported and then the, the news moved on. I'm, I've been baffled to this day about that incident. Can I comment on that? Yeah. Um, that was an attack on the airport. It was actually over 90 Syrian soldiers who were killed. And 110 were wounded. And that did indeed derail the ceasefire. Uh, some weeks later, CENTCOM did a study of that uh, claim by the military that it was just a mistake. Right. And their report made pretty clear, if you read it at all attentively, that um, it was not a mistake. There were a number of what they called irregularities in the way the whole decision was made, strongly suggesting that it was a deliberate attack. I didn't see this reported anywhere uh, in the Western press. It's just another example of how even when the system itself uh, uh, offers a corrective view, uh, it doesn't. It, it gets no traction, and nobody knows about it. And and I don't remember seeing any coverage that made the point you made that the timing was suspicious. Right? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Mark. And who's the uh, okay. So um, just to preface and then a question. The preface is I want to just start by accepting and appreciating the perspective you put out, which. So to me, bottom line is just that we're involved in the midst of a war propaganda campaign and that our role uh, in the left is to um, primarily prevent U.S. war for, for regime change. Um, and what you didn't say, I would add that, you know, it is also to support the right of self-determination in Syria and respect for international law. Given that, I also think it's not adequate to say Assad is not a saint. We have to be able to figure out what's happening in Syria. So my question to you is, how do we figure it out? Um, how, what, what would you suggest to be, any of you suggest to be the most reputable sources, um, the most, you know, the books, the articles, the sources that, that you think would be most helpful for us to actually understand the situation now? Um, um, can we write some things up for, for before we leave so people have some sources? Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, I say it's going to be controversial, but I mean, I read Tim Anderson's book, Dirty War in Syria, which struck me as basically quite sound. I recommend that book. Can we, can we maybe listen? And, and let's not forget um, Jason Hurtler's book, The Sins of Empire, Unmasking U.S. Imperialism. Vanessa B. Vanessa B. Lee B. E. E. L. E. Y. has written voluminously on all this. That's on the Twenty First Century Wire. Is the website where Vanessa B. Lee and um, Eva Bartlett or have a, a lot of their contents on that. So, so what, maybe I'm asking. Can I just yes, clarify okay. my question? I'm not asking for a source to expose the disinformation. I'm, I accept that as a given. I'm asking for sources that actually give reputable information about the nature of the Syrian state. That's what they're showing. That's okay. That's it. Okay. Patrick Seal. Patrick Seal. He, he wrote a great book on the Assad. Robert Fiskis. Harry uh, Hassan. Sorry. Uh, we go on to the next question. Oh, must go. Yes. Yeah, I. Uh, I find a lot of useful information on Facebook. <laughs> no, seriously, people who are actually traveling in Syria, where things are happening, uh, 
uh, you knew the, the Canadian woman, what was her name? Eva uh, Barber. Eva Barber. Barber. Yeah, she's excellent. Mm -hmm. And Janet uh, Kortekamp, who lives in the Washington area, uh, goes to Syria a lot. They're, they are credible people. And they're in some of the places that are appearing in the mainstream media, the corporate media, uh, uh, at that same time giving you a completely different spin on the story. So I'm not saying anybody is necessarily telling the truth. Everybody has an agenda. But the fact is, if you put all the agendas aside and kind of look at what you're seeing, some of the stuff will strike you as being more credible than other stuff. And so I find Facebook useful. And, and of course, Consortium News, that has been mentioned a, a number of times, does excellent investigative reporting on all these issues. Just counterpunch. Uh, yeah, of course, when I write anything. Uh, this is uh, for, um, for Mark, but uh, Philip and Jason can also chime in if they'd like. Uh, Mark, you mentioned, mentioned the Creole Commission in your talks uh, uh, about 30 minutes ago, and I was thinking about that, um, about the, the fact that um, so many members of that commission went on to, um, went to Madison Avenue and began working in advertising thereafter. And around the same time that the Creole Commission was established, Walter Lippmann produced his famous book on, on propaganda. Um, so I'm wondering if, in fact, this phenomenon of fake news is really a continuum um, it, uh, that, is, that began to surface in American foreign policy when the, uh, the first notions of, of globalism really began to develop uh, during World War I. Yellow Journal, Edward Bernays. Well, yeah. Edward Bernays, for example. This, this could be a whole separate panel, of course, but um, the fact is that that, that accomplishment, uh, you know, uh, basically whipping the American public up into a, a very productive war fever, getting them to buy bonds and, and enlist and so on, that completely changed the reputation of all the professions that were devoted to uh, uh, perception management, you know. I mean, before the war, uh, p public relations, uh, being a publicist, all this stuff was regarded as kind of day class A, uh, a little sleazy, and the business community had no use for it either. They thought, you know, you just put the name of the company before the public and you'll sell your goods. The war uh, demonstrated how tremendously useful it could be to take a scientific approach to perception management, and it also raised its moral profile because they had done this wonderful thing, you know, by helping us to defeat Germany and, and so on. And I do believe that, that the, your basic point is, is correct, that um, that talent, that the, the mobilization of that skill is inseparable from the project of empire. You, you see what I'm saying? So, as, you know, as long as the United States has had imperial ambitions, it has depended on that kind of ability to, to bring the American people along, you know, and it's just simply become more and more sophisticated and more and more inclusive through the decades, which is why we now have a moment where democracy now does, uh, in our episodes, defending the white helmets or pussy riot, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's why you get pussy riot playing themselves on House of Cards, you know? That's why you have Saturday Night Live uh, attacking uh, Dilma Rousseff, uh, you know, and, and routinely doing lusophobic comedy bits, you know, that are, you know, shockingly crude and kind of racist. That's Saturday Night Live, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, we're really at an unprecedented moment, and to answer your question, I don't think there's anything much we can do except what we're doing already, which is talking to the people we know and trying to spread the truth laterally, you know, to the extent that we act like Professor Davenport, we are functioning as the capillaries of the propaganda system. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because yeah. once you buy it like that and you go around screaming out this crap you've picked up, you are a propagandist yourself. All right? But we can counter that because, frankly, to be perfectly honest, I don't think there's much we can do about it. I think that what's going to happen is, I hope I'm wrong, but there's going to be some disastrous consequences to all this and the system's going to collapse eventually because it's unsustainable. I actually think that that's true, but I don't act as if I think that's true. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to add something to your, your question about what we can do. Um, I hate to say anything good about Congress, but the first gassing insta in instance in Syria, uh, which Obama was going to respond to, basically went down 
because of a popular reaction That's right. where people were writing in their hundreds to Congress. Absolutely. And Congress responded. <laughs> so, and the general rule, since I, I live in Washington and I know a lot of staffers, the general rule in a, a congressional or senatorial office is if they receive 20 communications on any subject, it goes straight to the senator or it goes straight to the representative, and they are very aware of it. So Congress is not as totally inert as it seems. And, and there is a way to play it. And it's a low threshold. Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and you, that's it. But if you feel strongly enough about these issues, you should do that. And you should write letters to the editor, to the newspapers. Every once in a while, one of them will get printed. Should also these go days, after you the can just make comments too. right underneath um, many mainstream articles. So. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. comments have if, if I may echo something that Mark said, it's pervasive. Uh, it's uh, a anybody who's pushing war. I don't even give a shit if it's Saturday Night Live. Okay, they're supposed to be comedians, right? In my recollection, we didn't, the drumbeat to war against the Iraq didn't happen immediately after the invasion of Kuwait. April Gillespie gave them the green light, and John Kerry found that out. And it went for a couple of weeks to, to what was going to happen. And then according to John Connolly's bi uh, bi uh, biography, I'm told, uh, it took Margaret... Uh, Thatcher to spank George H.W. Bush in Colorado one day and said, you're the damn leader of the free world. We can't let some wog, you know, just do whatever he wants. You know, you got to go step in there. And that's when the drumbeat to war started. And it, this is when they were uh, in Grenada, where they introduced the press pool, where they started to castrate the press in wars, okay? This is where the press was clamoring the Pentagon and everything, and, the, and already the Pentagon was getting them used to the idea, we're going to have a, a central news focused place, you're going to get all your news through this, okay? And the press started to chafe at it. Saturday Night Live ran a sketch mocking the mainstream media asking for all this secret information to the generals, and the generals were getting frustrated. That was the tipping point, in my opinion, about going to war in Iraq. When the White House saw how everybody was laughing at the media, for me, that was a big distinction. That Then it was all, all green light to go into Iraq after that. And it was Saturday Night Live. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. We really want to get to the yeah. yeah. uh, Before I ask the next story, may I ask an innocent question to have the video people to identify themselves. Yeah. I'm working for the panel. Yeah. But the gentleman. I have a public access show and I give my videos to the left forum. <coughs> Where can we get the video? Well, if you'd rather not be videoed, then just ask yeah. them to turn the camera. Yeah, I like I like you to not to take that's okay. This is for all the people who couldn't attend. Um, okay, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Um, now um, uh, one thing I have, as a Middle Eastern specialist, I would like to recommend everyone to look at Edward Said's Orientalism mm -hmm. to get an idea about the distortions of the Middle East here uh, in the in the U.S. and in the in the Western world. So that's that would be the number one on my on my list um, uh, of recommendations. Then. Um, uh, it is very unfortunate that we had a lot more gatherings of this sort when the Iraq War broke out and in 1990, 1991, 2003, and the invasion of Fallujah, and so on and so forth. And it all died down, more or less. A few books came out, a few videos came out, and it all died down. Now we're doing the same thing about Syria, trying to understand what's going on in Syria and trying to... Uh, uh, stop the war in Syria. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, another contention is going on, and that is Iranophobia and the possible, possible um, uh, physical hostilities against uh, against Iran. Some people have already spoken here about the, the so-called Iran threat. We had earlier a panel on Iran and Trumpism. <coughs> uh, I was one of the speakers there. And, and I think this is something else that we're going to have to watch out. The situation does not have to erupt as bad as it has been in Iraq, as bad as it has been in Yemen, as bad as it has been in Syria. What I'm saying is that we should also keep our eyes open about what else is going on. Outside of that, um, I have a question to, to panelists. Uh, in particular, I would like to hear uh, as many as possible, especially Mr. Uh, Giraldi. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a possibility, and some people such as Alexander Colburn have talked about it, 
and that is the possibility of a major Cold War erupting in, in the Middle East with possible two contradictory and contentious poles. On the one hand, you have the U.S. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, smaller uh, Arab states, and, uh, and Israel, um, uh, uh, Turkey is in between, oscillating still. That's one pole. On the other hand, you have, and the United States, of course. On the other hand, you have Russia, Iran, and China being for hegemony in the region. So I was wondering whether you can tell us a little bit about this eruption of a new, of a, of a Cold War in the region, given these contradictory poles. Thank you. Oh, can I just find out how many more people are left? Oh, okay, I think we have. Can I get at the end of the list? Make, we need to make this a part of the list. A little bit faster, but we'll go ahead and address that. We'll see what we have time. Okay, why don't we take a couple more? Yes, who's next? Okay, um, um, Thank you. Um, I just have to say, I was in Syria when they bombed that convoy. And what we heard about. Louder. I was in Syria when they bombed that convoy last September, and what we heard about the situation with, in Huta was that the rebels over there that fired got the weapons. It was from, uh, I don't want to be filmed, please, I'm sorry, Saudi and Turkey. And they came pre-assembled and that the rebels didn't know there was sarin in them. And that's why there was, they were, there was, when they did the inspection afterwards, they were, there was traces all over the place because they just randomly fired. Every day they were shelling there and they got a batch from the Turks and Saudis, and they were set up. I'm not defending them, it's their fault, no. but they supposedly did not know that there was sarin in there. And were, I think they would have fired them anyway. But um, what I wanted to ask you about, and, and, and Mr. Miller, you made an excellent point, was in 2005 was the real Arab Spring when, they, when Israel and um, CIA took out Prime Minister Hariri to indict, that was the political, and when that didn't work, then they had to now move on to this stage. But the guy, Ziad Abdel Noor, he was from the oil companies, and he said, in six months from now, we're gonna take out um, Assad. <coughs> and that's when they bombed Hezbollah. And what's interesting is that the clock always stop, starts and forgets the big Arab Spring, the Cedar Revolution, nobody remembers that? Cedar. Yeah, I mean, it was all over the pages of the front of Newsweek, and, and nobody covers that. And it was like the dress rehearsal. I can say something about the assassination of, of Hariri in Lebanon. I, I investigated that mm -hmm. and discovered that Hariri had been asked to set up a military base in Lebanon, and he didn't want it. Hence, regime change. And by the way, I would let people know that um, Syria's rejection of this gas pipeline. This is not the first time this has happened. The first time was in 1949 when the CIA did one of its first coups. Hardly anybody knows about it. It was a coup against the Syrian president because he was stalling on having the Trans-Arabian pipeline go through Syria. And if you want uh, documentation on this, uh, Douglas Little of Clark University was one of the first people to reveal it. Another person who's done a very good piece on all of this is Robert Kennedy Jr. He wrote a piece in Politico called Why the Arabs Don't Want Us in Syria. And he really gets into this history, and I commend you to read this article. And I just wanted to say, no offense to anyone not knowing about the oil, because it's constantly censored. It's totally censored. I can't get my book published. Uh, and so that's why you don't know about it. I think, people to so, I think people so much take it for granted that it's a given in that area, that maybe it's not, maybe it should be mentioned more. But the other reason that I feel is like I interviewed some Lebanese forces guys over there and um, and I talked to Israeli Defense Forces guys in 2002 and they were they were talking about okay, we got some other well, thank you so much for the establishment motive over through Syria I mean I, I was going to ask about this in the beginning but um, in terms of the motive 
Uh, do, you, do you all actually believe that it's solely oil in these pipelines, or is there another like reason for the like geopolitical uh, militaristic aggression that we see from the Western powers in, in this region? Well, I, I think part of it is uh, trying to eliminate uh, a regime that's uh, set on um, an independent economic course, or, or one that's not involved with the U.S. Yes. system. You know, it's part of that. Uh, yeah, it's part of that uh, neoliberal program. You know, before the invasion of Iraq and, and, and after it. Uh, what's the guy's name who was Wesley the point Clark. man for Bush? Paul Bremer. Paul Bremer was was talking perfect madness about how they're going to turn Iraq into a kind of uh, neoliberal paradise. You know, everything was going to be privatized. Uh, it was going to be like Ayn Rand should be on all the coins. That, you know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's not just oil. Oil is key. But there's also this sort of demented, uh, it's exactly the kind of um, revolutionary fervor that we always impute to communists. You know, that we're going to remake uh, 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 Syria now was Iraq in, into a, a you know kind of neoliberal theme park. As well as countering Russian influence. Countering like Russian influence. Right. right. Well, they want to do away with Russia too for the yeah. same reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shall we continue? Yeah. Well, thank you for your question. And who is next? Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Um, you know, um, first of all, uh, I, I, just a brief comment about Orientalism, which is that. Uh, people find it easier to believe, I mean, the propaganda is really racist that we get. Because if you say that the true Arab, the ones that we support, oh, well, they're just monsters, but that's just the way they are in Saudi Arabia, for instance, the, the al Saud family is somehow the representative people of the region or the uh, al Khalifas <laughs> or any of these other families that govern these places. And then we dismiss the civilized uh, advances, the independence of countries like Syria, or even in Iran, they're not Arabs, but then the Iranians, and the things that they've achieved, because people don't understand it, and we dismiss the complexity of that, then that's an incredibly racist way to perceive the world. But the other thing I heard, uh, you know, um, the talk about uh, Cold War in the Middle East, if you live in the Middle East, it isn't cold, and I have a hard time understanding how someone could call that a Cold War, because, um, you know, the Cold War was basically a stalemate. Nobody was, like, invading anybody during the Cold War. Well, the United States was doing some serious damage in Eastern Europe and Greece and places like that, but... Southeast Asia. Yeah, so, well, not Africa. But um, my point is that I don't, I don't know how cold it is, and I wonder if... If you make a comment on the fact of, is it really hegemony to have regional alliances that just don't have to include the U.S. because it isn't in the region? Whereas, you know, I'm wondering about the whole, con how that fits into the propaganda terminology. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I don't leave anybody out. There's, there's no more time. No more time. No more time. Right here. Right here in front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can imagine, I can't imagine the kind of thing that would happen to, mili to the head of CENTCOM and the military when they, if they were to appear in print in the New York Times, say, but it happened, nothing happened to them. They said that, oh, this agreement with Russia, we're not so sure we should go, this was before the agreement. We're not so sure we should have this agreement, you know, and they actually uh, went directly up against what the president was uh, was about to set up. Now, you know, that if you have the military doing that, you know, the, the head of the head of the regional military command there saying directly that we're not so sure this is a good idea, and we'll give it a try, or maybe we won't. That's actually what they were saying directly so i mean you know you know they might be sitting in a jail someplace i don't know but but the, that uh, yeah and then and then as you say i think the name the dera zor was the name of this of the of the town and that was it struck me immediately this was breaking up the uh, any possibility of a tactical 
uh, let's not let's not kill each other and let's share some intelligence. Um, I, I and just scattered. I'm sorry, but Hillary Clinton, you know what she said about Trump's attack? She said, "Well, you know, I agree with it, of course, but it was a one-off thing." You know, yeah. that's what she said. So that the Democratic Party is more willing to carry out a, a full-scale war, war in Syria with the no-fly zones and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and finally, up an interesting point about the Democrats being the war party. Yes. <laughs> and finally, just one thing. Could somebody describe um, what happened in 2011 in the streets in Damascus and where you get the story that it was a pure upri virginal uprising against a dictator. And uh, the, some of the reports I've gotten has been, have been that from the start there were military elements within the insurrection. But it was particularly though by, by late 2011 that the, uh, that, that uh, uh, um, Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, others were pouring in arms and Saudi Arabia was already doing that. Could somebody go yeah, through that? Thank you that? so much for that important question. We're almost out of time, so I just oh. want to make sure that anyone's dying to say something now. We pretty much probably have one last question. Uh, okay, one minute. Very, very quickly, please. Yes, Nobody on the panel, and I haven't heard anything in the room here. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I haven't heard anybody mention the word religion in any of this stuff or ethnic conflicts within the context of Syria or any of these regions, be it Iraq or Saudi Arabia, Yemen. What's your feeling about how it's either being manipulated or, or it's a cause of these conflicts? I'd be curious to see what your reaction is. And, and lastly, and you really are the last one. Okay. <laughs> I'll make it real quick. Well, I'm just here to support people like uh, on this panel and to out the thinly veiled imperialists like Jeremy Scahill, Amy Goodman, that do, that are plenary speakers at this conference and support, I'm also supporting the three or four banned panels that are on uh, the floor number two that were packed like this room. And so that's what I'm doing, okay, to get you. the word out. Okay. Thank you, and thank everybody asked for very intelligent questions, and you're interested. Greatly appreciate it. Does the panel have any last comments? Any yeah, can I, make, yeah. Can, I, can I make a last comment, which is unrelated? Um, the, the incident we were talking about before, where the column of, where the Syrian soldiers were killed, this obviously was intended to disrupt Obama's policy. It was carried out by the military, uh, I, I believe it was the local commander, uh, uh, Lieutenant General, admittedly, but he was the, the area commander who ordered the attack and uh, clearly did so deliberately. And um, I would tie this kind of thing in with what's going on. Now, again, I'm not trying to say a good thing about Trump, but the fact is these leaks coming from the top levels of the intelligence agencies and law enforcement in the United States are incredibly dangerous. These people are trying to... Uh, fix an election which they were not happy with by means of leaking classified information. And they're getting away with it. Not a single one has been even slapped on the wrist. So this is something just to think about because we're seeing a we're, we're seeing a strange, what was Seven Days in May? What was the movie about? Yeah. 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 Where, yeah. where, where, where Bert Lancaster was going to take over. Anyway, uh, we're seeing that happen in reality. It could be a constitutional coup. Yeah. That there was a trial run in Brazil last yeah. summer. It's very interesting. You look at how Dilma was yeah. shoved out yeah. by people far more corrupt than her for right. technicality. And, you know, it, it seems like the same thing. We're headed in that same direction now, and no one's talking about it. Well, yeah. Maybe the worst thing Trump has done, in a way, is to make people think, many people think, A, that the corporate press is honest, tells the truth, unlike himself. <laughs> and B, that the CIA and the FBI and the NSA are our friends, yeah. and they believe in democracy, and they're uh, fighting to save it, and a lot of people buy this. So that these leaks uh, that are you know coming thick and fast are indeed meant to uh, un undo his presidency. Now, for my money, which is worthless, um, <laughs> The whole thing is complicated by the fact that there is significant evidence that, that they actually stole the election in the swing states. 
I mean, this is my area. Just as there is overwhelming evidence that Hillary stole the nomination, you know, through serial primary theft. So, so you know, we, we are we are where we are today because of uh, you know election theft, rampant election theft last year. Bernie Sanders should actually be president. I don't think things would be that much different if he were. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 he would find the same horse's head in his bed that he found. You know what I'm saying? So it's not a, it's not a matter of personalities or anything like that. We we are. I mean, I think this is a great room now that the professor has left it. <laughs> and I think that um, what we really should be doing is uh, uh, criticizing, strongly criticizing our favorite left media when they promote a war agenda. We should be speaking out against them and let them hear from us because, because you know, Mother Jones and Ross Story and uh, Slate and Salon and uh, Democracy Now!, Jeremy Scahill, Noam Chomsky, you know, these are people who are, again, themselves serving as war propagandists when they voice their moral qualms about the Assad regime, you know. They, they, no, they should all be criticized, they should all hear from us so that they can maybe uh, cool it a little bit. <laughs> I just wanted to mention to your point, sir, uh, Stephen Gowans wrote a very interesting piece about what happened on the street in 2011 in Syria. He looks at a lot of media, mainstream media sources and what they were reporting. And it's very interesting. I, I would look him up online. He's on... How do you spell it? G -O -W -A -N -S. Yeah, I'll write it up. G-O-W, Stephen, G-O-W-A-N-S. And then, uh, to your question, sir, I, I recently wrote an article where I... I think I mentioned uh, Aristotle's four causes. How Aristotle had pointed out there are more than one cause to an issue, and I tried to relate that to the Manchester attacks and what we saw in Orlando and all the different terrorist attacks in the West, and how my contention was that our interventions in the Middle East uh, radicalize and infuriate people, and then they, then radical Islam comes in and to use Hillary Clinton's favorite term, weaponizes them. And then they come back, uh, as that guy did the, uh, did the Ma Manchester bombing, and, uh, and commits that horrible crime. So I think, I think you have to look at, and, and when you look at the media, you see a lot of talk about radical Islam and how these people get radicalized, but very little about the underlying causes that turn these people in the direction of extremism in the first place. So I think there are causes there, and I, I tend to focus on uh, the cause that's coming out of Washington as opposed to, you know, the cause, I guess, that's coming out of Riyadh, but they're, I think they're connected in that way. They're both causalities of this um, extremist. To the gentleman's question about religion, who do we support in the Middle East? The monarchies and the religious states. Yeah. Who do we hate and destroy? Secular, the secular, secular Arab states. nationalists. Right. Yeah. Okay? Right. So they game religion. Uh, Rahed Jarar, uh, Iraqi uh, architect, who was a great blogger during the war over there. He said, my father was Sunni, my mother was Shia. I didn't even know what my neighbors were. It was no big deal. Okay, yes, there's a historical thing between Shia. But that's just stuff that we Westerners don't understand, and they, they game it up. It's Islamic State? What's that? That's a perverted religion? So, no, the, the, the religious thing is game. It's totally game. We're against the secular it's, it's also, it's been It's been cultivated by, by the U.S. Yes. and by Israel Inflamed. in order to destroy the leftist. Uh, like, you know, That's the right. PLO was destroyed, basically, by a, a very carefully cultivated Islamist alternative, right? And then they act, oh, my God, where do they come from? This is horrible. Right? Secular Arab states like Libya, where it was a par the, the number one country in Africa after yes. being the worst country in Africa, that's the target. Yeah. Is, Assad, is Assad like the last vestige of Arab nationalism? nationalism? Well, he certainly is an Arab nationalist, yeah. sure, the Ba'ath yeah. Party. I mean, and, and also religion. That's a, religion. a whole collection of religions there Mother that right. somehow they've been able to keep it together. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not forget that all these foreign interests are there illegally except except for Russia. Yes, you had one more question. Uh, actually, it's, it's a, can I? It's a, it's a statement. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the naive Martian in the room, maybe. Um, Welcome. 
So we are all responsible now for everything that's been talked about. And I, when I say we, I don't just mean everybody in this room. I mean this country and probably most of the world. Um, in 1987, I started a company called Learning to Live with Conflict. The doctrine for that company is that a peaceful world is not possible without individual people who see peace as a possibility, meaning that the options we perceive as individuals collectively shape the alternatives which exist for the whole world. Until we can find opportunities in our own life to do it differently, there's no way we can dream up world peace because our, our individual consciousness collect collectively shapes the reality that, the, that we inflict on the whole world. If most of this country thought that war absolutely every single time violence as a means of solution to any problem was ever the solution, if most people in this country thought that, the, the army, the military would have to hold a bake sale to build a damn weapon. But too many of us still say, well, you know, there are times, and as long as we think like that, we're lost and we're never going to get found. And I'm sorry this sounds dramatic, but man, I've been listening for decades. We need to end war. We need to end violence as the response ever. It always makes things worse. It never makes things better. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Tomorrow, but I think it's going to take a little bit more than hope. I think it's going to take a lot of vigilance and some amount of dedication and organizing to really stand up to the, the aggressive lie. So I would really like to thank our panelists today for taking the time out of their lives. <laughs> Take a picture of that stuff. Yeah. It's great, great resources. Oh, yes. The bombing in Manchester where the guy blew himself up, that is directly related to U.S. interventionism in Libya and the yeah, British government's actions in Libya. And we don't want that kind of thing happening over in our city. We really need to interact with the